Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio. My name is Dr. Michael Rice. They call me the Forgiveness Doctor. And we're here to talk about forgiveness again. Of course, the title of my book is Why Is This Happening to Me Again? And What You Can Do About It. And the book, if this is your first time on the show, is about a conversation between myself and a character named Richard, who's a a composite of several very real characters, who really don't want to be responsible for their lives, want to play the game that everybody else is at fault for what's happening in their world. And so I get to do a lot of push-pull, a lot of conversation with Richard about, well, you know, this is your third divorce. You tell me it's all those women and all you have to do is get out of town and everything will be okay. Sounds like you're taking the geographic cure. And you remember the last time you took the geographic cure, you ended up in the same place because, of course, he took you along. And so Richard starts to suspect that maybe he's involved in his life, which is a, a big stretch for a lot of people in our culture to, to actually imagine that maybe they've got something to do with what's going on. And so we want to look today at how we can support you in the process of forgiveness, in the process of learning to be responsible in, in new ways, on new levels, uh, on a continuous basis. Yesterday on our show we did the reality management worksheet, and we're hoping that uh, folks will have some questions for us. The reality management worksheet is the uh, the tool that we use in Why Is This Happening to Me Again? The book is written in a, a format where I t- walk uh, the character, Richard, through uh, the forgiveness process. Interestingly enough, the most common feedback or two pieces of common feedback we get when people read the book are, number one, people recognize themselves and the response is, oh, my God, I'm Richard. Or the second response is, oh, my God, I live with Richard, <laughs> and he needs to read this book, or she needs to read this book. So so we're here to uh, to support everyone in learning to be responsible for their pain, for their trauma, for the wonderful things in their lives, and by coming back in touch with the things that uh, perhaps aren't such wonderful creations, we get to begin to change them. And so that's where we're going to head today. And uh, if you have any calls... Uh, the call in number is 646 4169 Well, I hear a sweet voice in the background here. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Hey. Um, but we don't have any uh questions yet, so let's uh I'm not sure that the person is even on yet that had asked the question the other day um pertaining to that they were in a relationship and uh their partner had a a friend who was just a friend, you know, that they used to run around and all that. And, and the friend's now putting pressure on them that, you know, oh, since you've gotten this partner now, you don't, you know, go out with me, you don't run around with me or whatever. And so this partner's feeling guilty and, and they're wondering, you know, is it okay to let my partner go running around with their friend? And, you know, how should I feel about that? And I'm not sure that they're on yet listening, but that was the... Uh, question that left on the board day before yesterday before we signed off and of course yesterday we couldn't take callers so you want to address okay. that and then I do have another one out of the uh, chat room when you finish with that one sure well what do you say we uh, we just talk a little bit about the other show that we're doing as well and uh, let folks know about call-ins and such and maybe we can take this first question and see if the caller comes back that was asking the uh, the question when we completed uh, in our uh, second to last show. So why don't we go ahead and uh, the the workshop, or pardon me, the um, radio show that we're doing today, of course, is part of our blog talk, uh, Mind Shifter Radio. And uh, on Tuesdays, we actually combine two shows together. We're doing a show on WWNN, Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network, which is a 50,000-watt radio station in South Florida, it's actually in Boca Raton, and the station broadcasts all the way from uh, up in Port St. Lucie to Miami, and it can be picked up uh, from 2 to 3 o'clock on Tuesdays at 14.70 a.m. The uh, the show we did yesterday, if you weren't tuned into it, was actually a step-by-step. We took a, a volunteer, someone actually who's done quite a bit of forgiveness work and works with people around the idea of forgiveness, was recently introduced to our work. And so uh, Pamela uh, 
volunteered to uh, to be walked through a worksheet, which is what we did. And if you go to our website, Jeannie, is the link up for the uh, the MP3 of it or the podcast? Jeannie? I keep Hello, forgetting Jeannie. to unmute myself. I forget to unmute myself. <laughs> so I'm sitting there talking okay. to you and you can't hear me. <laughs> um, yes, it's already up. It, it, the uh, recording will be the same as um, it is for the Blog Talk Radio. But if you go right. to our, it's www.whyagain.com forward slash mindshifterradio.php or there's a link on the front page if you don't want to remember all of that just go to whyagain.com and click on the mindshifter radio it'll take you to that page scroll down to the bottom and there is all of the archived shows and the one from yesterday I actually marked it WWNN Holistic Lifestyles Walk Through a Reality Management Worksheet with Pamela Gregory so it's very Uh, clear do we have a link do we have a link to Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network with that podcast? Yes, if they if they click on um, the on the home page, there is a link there that they can click, and it will take them directly to the Lifestyles Radio. Okay, if we can, we'd like to encourage you if you want to download that, and it walks through from step one all the way through the latest worksheet. If you would click on the link to Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network. That would be better than loading it through Blog Talk. Here's the reason. That is, that was our first show, and the more hits we get on the show, the more likely we'll be to be doing more of them. And so the click-through has to be to Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network. Pick up the MP3 or the, the podcast there. They're free, and it will benefit us if you will download it, if you will ask friends to download it, because the more clicks there are, the more Holistic Lifestyles Radio with their kind invitation. Uh, thank you, John Hollis, for uh, for inviting us to be one of your hosts. The more clicks they have, the more activity they have, the more they're going to say, ooh, people really are interested in this and we want to do more. So please click through to Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network and pick up the uh, podcast from yesterday. Uh, again, it's free. And it will. There's a link on the front page of whyagain.com, and that's www.whyagain.com. And if you click that Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network uh, link, you'll go through, you'll pick up the podcast, and you'll be putting a vote in for us to do more shows on Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network. And I really acknowledge John for the work he's done to put that together over the last three years. It's uh, it's uh, awesome to have the opportunity to be on uh, a station that has a, a market locally where they broadcast to over 5 million people, and then it streams to about 17 different markets in the country. So it you can listen live uh, to that show on Tuesdays if you're in Las Vegas, and there are 20, I believe, 17 different stations that uh, that folks will be able to listen on. And, of course, we'll expand that if we get lots of clicks on that link. So we'd appreciate you doing that. So Tuesdays, because we're on live radio, uh, we are not able to take phone calls. And uh, the reason for that is liability reasons. And so on Tuesdays, we'll be doing a straight talk type, type of thing. There won't be call-ins. You will be able to, however, go to Blog Talk Radio because we'll be broadcasting simultaneously. You will be able to go to broadcast or to uh, Blog Talk, our uh, our link there, and uh, get in the chat room. And of course, we'll be glad to answer questions. We just, with the live station, don't have the liability coverage to uh, to allow uh, people to actually get on the the phone and uh, and call into the station live. We're in a little different situation here with our our uh, Blog Talk Radio. So, so that's the story on that. And uh, so, Jeannie, you've got a question there. Let's cover that question and see if the folks who asked the original one get back on with us, so that we can give them some input directly. And maybe, okay. you know, if they show up late, it'll make more sense to hold that question till till they get to be with us and get to hear our answers. Okay, cool. Well, the first one is it says, can Michael speak a little bit about the importance of being in a space of love before trying to work with the dissociated mind, or can someone actually collapse a false reality that is currently in there, and if not, why not? The, the last sense of that, can someone actually collapse, collapse a false reality if they're right in the middle of it, and if not, why not? Yes. 
Okay. Cool. Good. Great question. So I've been doing this work now for about 40 years, and about 20 years ago, 20 or so years into this work, I started to look for, you know, my, my search has always been for principle. What's the principle behind things? And once you establish a principle, you know whether anything's true or not true by that principle. Those who don't understand principle can believe, be convinced to believe all sorts of things, but when you understand a the principle, then something has to be consistent with that principle in order to be true. Otherwise, it can't possibly be. And so the looking at the principle behind what, what happens, what, what, what was the common link, what for me, became obvious in looking at that question was that if someone could take something that they had in hiding in their minds, one of those things where people say, well, gee, I didn't even know that was in me, and get that to surface, that's half of the healing process, but only half. The second half is that if love is conscious, active, and present in the space, there is an action, there is an activity to the presence of love. It's something tangible. And when love is present, because that's the underpinning, the underlying force in the universe, the simple exposure of anything inside of us that's not true to the active presence of love, it's, it's like exposing it to the universal solvent. Whatever's not true automatically, instantaneously, starts to disappear and starts to fall away. And so things that may have been major emotional issues yesterday, when you're willing and able to stay connected to the active presence of love, begins to dissolve what's not true about what you believe. And as what's not true about what you believe is exposed to love, you start to see through the fallacies and the falsities of it. When one is in denial, for those who maybe have not been listening to the show, when one is in denial that I don't want to own this, this isn't mine, George made me feel this, Harry made me feel this, and last week it was Bill and the week before it was Mary, well, you'll notice that it's your physiology that produces feelings. Nobody can make you feel anything, but if you're in denial of what you're feeling, pardon me, <coughs> that denial leads to a state called dissociation. When we're dissociated some, from something that's in our minds, we have no power over it. That dynamic, whatever it is, assumes power and control over our lives. So that's the importance of having love present. And so, you know, if, and, and that's the beauty when we go into the Healing Through Relationships workshop, we talk about how if I've got an issue that's just so big for me that I can't, I can't be love in its presence. I can't do it. Then, you know, I ask Jeannie to be the supporter for that. And as I expose what's not true to that present love, Jeannie gets to support my healing process and vice versa. That's the whole bottom line of partnership and why it's so powerful and oftentimes why people have issues that when they try to do it on their own, they just really have difficulty working through because they're so stuck in the belief about that issue. So, yes, the presence of love becomes key. Now, can you do an instant on the spot? Absolutely. That's the idea of doing. You know, we've suggested to people that you pick up that worksheet, and if you haven't seen the worksheet yet, please go to www.whyagain.com, www.whyagain.com, on the right-hand side, you'll see a, a link that says Download Worksheets. The first um, link there is a new Chapter 24 from my book. That's where I give Richard the instructions for going through the worksheet. So you can download the, the instructions and then the seven-step worksheet. And download that. And, again, if you want to get a, a live verbal uh, walking through it, you can go to the front page of our website, and at the top, Jeannie's put a link to Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network. You can click on, click on that. Click on that, right. Okay. You can click on that, and when you do, it'll take you to Holistic Lifestyles Radio Network, and you can download yesterday's show. And uh, you'll have it to listen to as many times as you want. And, of course, we will be here to support you with questions. Uh, that you have as you go along through that process. Uh, one of the difficulties in our work in the past has been that we travel all over the globe, and so 
when we're in Sweden and leave, it's kind of hard to duplicate ourselves and leave support behind. And of course, Peter and Tanya Streno there are are carrying on that support, but uh, they're only two people. So now we have this venue of five days a week uh, radio where we can uh, give you support no matter where you are on the globe because anybody in the world can tap into this through uh, through their computers and listen in and ask questions. So it's a delight to be here. So yes, in an instant, should you be willing to go through the forgiveness process as you practice with it? And that's one of the reasons why we suggest when people start with the reality management worksheet, which is the forgiveness process from the Aramaic, that you do at least five a day for 40 days. And as you do, you'll be training your mind to do that process for you. And your mind will begin to kick in, click in, and yes, you can collapse things very rapidly. I can remember one particular time, and and this this dramatically in all the years I've been doing this work only happened to me once, and and, and it was so dramatic the result that it's kind of a a pillar for me. It's it's one of those beacons that I always head toward in my own work in my own process. But I was in a conflict with someone, and of course in my mind I had it all made up how it was their fault and they were wrong. And I stopped instead. I started to do some still point breathing and did a forgiveness worksheet. And the instant, I mean, this is like three minutes later, the instant I completed that worksheet, I literally could not remember how I had rationalized that it was their fault. And that's a a sure sign that you've really changed that dissociated mind. And the dissociated mind is something that's not easily changeable. The reason is because once we deny and dissociate from it, it's not ours to uh, to take control of. It's, it, it, we can sit around and critically think about its content. We can think about the behaviors in the dissociated mind and how much we dislike them, and we can be committed to functioning differently. But if we don't ever do the forgiveness process and collapse that dissociated mind, come back into direct relationship with whatever we've hidden there, we can't change it. Once back in direct relationship, you can change it. And it's Aramaic forgiveness that collapses that dissociation and takes you back into that relationship. All right. So does that that make sense? Honey, do you have any any thoughts to add to that? Uh, no, I don't. I was just reading a, another person in the chat room, and, and their situation is really deeper than I think we probably need to cover on the radio. Um, um, the part we could cover is that she thinks um, she was record doing a, a – she bugged her boyfriend and because she uh-huh. thought he was doing something uh, like – paying for sex or something, and uh, so she bugged the phone, and she found out he's into something even deeper, and it's actually, in my opinion, uh, probably should contact the police on it, but she says that when they're together that she loves him and that she thinks he loves her, but this this whole other side of him that is very dangerous. Mm. Well, you know, the first order of business there, uh, yeah, you have a legal responsibility, and you might want to... Uh, to step into your responsibility in that regard, especially if it's putting people in danger. Uh, that's I, I know of situations where that's happened before and people didn't step forward and then uh, carried a huge burden when uh, when there was somebody severely hurt over it. And I don't have any clue what we're talking about here in terms of the facts of the thing. But if somebody else is in danger, I'd suggest the first order of business is take, um, take legal action, take some kind of legal responsibility. But beyond that, uh, some of the, some of the options you might have is to look at why you would be attracted to someone who's involved in uh, circumstances like that. You might do that, that would be uh, a good worksheet topic, you know, um, here I am, you know, whatever, you know, George, and uh, he's doing thing, illegal things, and I feel, you know, scared or helpless. What's my thought? And go through the process. That would be a, a productive worksheet to do. Uh, it, it might also be productive to look at uh, trust issues that you've created a relationship where you don't feel like you can trust your partner, and it sounds like perhaps you can't. And so you might want to look at whether or not if there's not trust and you say, I love them, well, one of the things we 
inform people of is that it's not possible to love someone else. The truth is you can't love anyone. Love is not a verb. It's not something we do to each other. It's who we are. It's a state of being. And when we're looking for somebody else to love us, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. We did a show on that last week. And when we're looking for love in all the wrong places, we're in a posture where uh, we will usually do anything to be approved of because the, the not what we call the non-being mind's definition of love is approval. Love is a state of being. You know, we've asked the question, we've, we've brought this forward several times, of imagine holding a newborn child and what's your descriptor of the newborn and virtually everywhere on the planet we've ever asked the question, the answer is always some variation on the theme of love. And the reason is because that's human life. That's what we are. It's not what we do. And so you get to experience love when you experience who you are. Now, if you sacrifice who you are to live in the lie of, I'm with somebody I can't trust, I'm with somebody that's a danger and harming people, then you might want to do some worksheets around why you would put yourself in that posture. What what about you feels you deserve that type of relationship? To, uh, to be in a situation where there's that kind of, uh, of threat or danger going on and, you know, looking at whether it could turn on you. And so there'd be some of the areas I'd suggest working in, if that's helpful. I hope it is. And uh, if there are any more questions, um, you know, maybe just pop them back in the chat room and we'll continue with that topic. Yeah, we uh, there's several conversations going back to her and everybody's agreeing that um, she needs to take the recordings to the police. He's saying that it's all in her head that it's not really true. And I'm like, well, if it's on a recording, then it's not in your head and that she needs to get some protective space for herself. And then after she does that, then also do the worksheets on the fear and the trust and looking for love outside of herself. And she says, yeah, but I want to be with him. And so then all the comeback is, why do you want to be with someone who's like that? Um, and she says, um, it's like I don't know what to to believe. He blatantly says that, um, it's all in my head, and I never in a million years would pick it. Uh, he comes across as a good, normal guy. It's very bizarre. There's a huge part of yourself. Oh, this is someone responding back to her. There's a huge part of yourself that you're denying. Get away from him and heal your mind with Michael's work after you go to the police. Yeah, if it's all in your head and you take it to the police, the police will say, well, this is all in your head. There's nothing here. And then, fine, you're finished with it. But if there's something on that recording that involves some sort of uh, danger to someone, then it's not in your head, and I think you have a responsibility to uh, to bring that forward, to protect yourself and to break, maybe protect him as well, but others involved uh, in whatever whatever it is that's going on. And to respect yourself enough. You know, uh, if, if, if I sell myself so short that I would be with somebody who's doing something from the gutter, uh, and call that a love relationship. Why? Why would I go there? What? What am I selling out? What? What? What part of me believes that's all I deserve? Because I have someone who approves of me. You know, I, I from the sound of what you're saying, this doesn't sound like the expression of a human life. This sounds like the expression of a, a non-human or an inhuman life, one based in hostility or fear. What part of me believes that I deserve that and would interpret? the approval that I get in that relationship as love and give up a direct experience of who I am. So that would be some of my input on it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, another until, until they respond back, they haven't said anything. Another person says, what's Michael's thoughts on the heart wants what the heart wants? <laughs> I hear well, it and uh, first of all, let, let me just offer the... Uh, the young lady that's that's texting in that uh, we certainly join in and I'll ask everybody on our show right now to join in the space of support for you being able to be strong enough and convicted enough and clear enough to make the right choice in this situation and to be approving of yourself if there's something to hold somebody accountable for uh, about that you approve of yourself deeply enough that you're willing to do that. That would be my support for you. And we hold you in our hearts and send you our love. Now, she just wrote about back and she she just wrote back and said that um uh every reading that she's had says he is her soulmate. So it doesn't make sense that she should get rid of him if he's her soulmate. 
And I think she, I, you I need to watch when, it comes to, when you watch, do readings and things like that. Um, that could be dangerous too. I mean, depending on, you know, who you go to, whether they're actually intuitive or whether it's a psychic, and there's a difference between those two. No. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting. I didn't say get rid of him. That wasn't my suggestion. But we're saying that she uh, needs that to get might, out of That space. might be a relationship. Pardon me, sweetie? We're telling her she needs to get out of his space and get protective okay. custody, get protective help. Okay. Okay. But beyond that, you know, we're, we're humans. And, and many of us function as non-humans. When we're in our hostility and fear, we're functioning as non-humans. And the idea is to bring healing and, of course, what we're looking to do is to bring healing to every mind, heart, and being on the planet. And so I definitely support the opening of your healing in this situation. I support the opening of his healing. I know that I've spent a lot of time working in prison systems. And in those prison systems, uh, there's a lot of healing that takes place if the people are there to support that process. And, you know... Sometimes that's an appropriate place. If people are a danger in the community to themselves and others, you're doing them, you're doing yourself, you're doing others a favor. And perhaps there's a space for healing in that situation with that relationship. But from what you're saying, and again, I don't know the uh, the definition of the circumstances, but from what you're saying, it sounds like there could be some danger in just um, hanging out and accepting it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're we're telling her, you know, that she needs to also love herself, at, and realize that the love is actually within her, and uh, yep. you know, that people do think, crazy think things. Back, think back, and you know, when you were taken from the womb and somebody held you, they went, "What an awesome presence of love." That's your human life. That's what they are. And this young man, whatever's going on for him, that's who he is too. However, we come into a world that starts to put thumbprints on us. And if we do crazy things out of those thumbprints, there's an accountability for that. The universe holds us accountable. The sooner we become accountable, the less the cost is for that accountability. And especially if it's something that is of physical danger to yourself or to others, I'd suggest beware and uh, and you have some legal responsibility there if it's uh, if it's activity that's damaging others that uh, you're aware of. And we hold you in our hearts and in healing. I I understand that's a tough situation, very difficult situation. But um, the other side of the coin is whatever this is about hasn't turned on you. He's still in a space of approving of you, and, and, and you think that's great. But I'd offer that approving of you is not love. And if that capability is there, whatever the danger is involving someone else, in an instant that could turn on you as well. And so I just offer be aware, take care of yourself, do your work. You got those worksheets, get clarity of mind, and move forward. And we support you. Awesome. Okay, so let's get back to the other question that was out there about when people say, well, you know, my heart, I just want what my heart wants. Like, you know, but I guess whatever he's saying, whatever you feel, you just go for it. If that's what you want, you do it. Well, my, my input would be, you know, we live in a culture that doesn't teach us much about the impact of what we do with our thoughts and with our actions. It's just like, well, you know, it's a feel-good society. Just do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And I can't tell you how many people I've worked with up in their 60s, 70s, 80s who look back over their lives and went, oh, my God, I had no idea that's what I was setting up for myself. Oh, man, did I, do I ever wish somebody had educated me back then? And so, you know, becoming aware how this energy system works um, as you become aware, there are things that will serve your life force and there are things that will destroy it. And it, it's really easy to, to set a standard for that. And that is, if you're considering any form of behavior, would a newborn child do that? 
if a newborn child would not do it, if if that pure essence of love would not do it, then you probably have no business doing it either. Because what's going to happen is you're going to engage in an energy. Relative, you know, in, in the system of medicine I'm trained in, naturopathic medicine, we honor the so-called body rather than as a body, as an energy system. And we recognize that every frequency, every energy that's held in the system has an impact upon every cell in the system. And when we put frequencies in that are unlike human life, frequencies of rage, hostility, fear, or let's say inflicting pain on someone, then by doing so, what we do is we uh, put an energy into the cell that starts the deterioration of the cell. I wish Tim were on the line right now. Is Tim there by any chance? Tim was sharing with me a really cool story uh, from the book he's been working with called The Art of Blessing. You know, he shared a passage with us last week about a man who was in the concentration camps and watched his family get murdered and and realized that he had to... uh, had to do uh, one thing or another. He was either going to hate or he was going to love. And when six years later they liberated the camp, uh, this man was a picture of health, living on garbage food in a garbage environment. And the the liberators thought, oh, the physicians were all, well, this guy's in such perfect health. Obviously, he's just been here a very short time. And he'd been there for six years, uh, but he'd chosen to love. And even in that garbage environment with that garbage food and all that abuse, because he made a commitment to love, the only reason he lived through the raid on his town was he was a lawyer who spoke German and was useful to them. And they murdered, his, if I remember correctly, his two children and his wife in front of his face. And six years later, he's a picture of health, physically fit, strong, alive, because he refused to engage in the energy that destroys. And Michael, when we choose, on the yeah. line now. Oh well, maybe he's got that story to read to us that uh, that he shared with me this morning. We chatted this morning, and he was sharing with me a story that uh, was in the book on the gentle art of blessing, and uh, a story about uh, uh, an Asian, uh, I guess, kind of a proverb. Tim, would that be what you call it? Yeah, it's the. Uh, I think it was Malayan. And I'm trying to dig through the book here to find it. It's it's the idea that uh, many cultures have had over the years that when we send out love, we get love back. And if we send out anger and hatred and negative feelings, that's what we get back. So this one story is about how we all have, we as human beings, we are walls. We have a large wall, and the wall has nooks in it or spaces in it, different shaped spaces in it. Some hold white birds, which have the energy of love and healing, and some hold black birds, which have the energy of anger and hatred and bitterness and resentment. And if I get angry at someone and I send some of my black birds out of my wall, if the other person gets angry at me, they send blackbirds out at me, and that means my blackbirds have a space to land on his wall and deposit my anger and my poison. And because I've sent the blackbirds out from my wall, his anger, bitterness, and resentment in the form of his blackbirds can land in my wall and deposit that poison in me. But if I send the blackbirds out to him and he's not angry at me and he only sends love out at me, My blackbirds can't land in his wall and deposit anger and bitterness and resentment. So they come back to land in my wall and deposit all of that angry energy in me. And in the meantime, if I don't send love back to him, his white birds can't land on my wall because there are no open spaces for the white birds. So they carry their love and healing energy back to him, and I lose out on that as well. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and of course we talk on that in the workshop. We talk about that as uh, as the energy dynamic of, uh, you know, you, you send hate to someone and you take a poison hoping they'll die. And uh, uh, when you engage in that hatred, you get the original, they get the carbon copy and may not be home for delivery. So that's a great way to uh, to say it. I, I'm, uh, it's a, a delightful proverb to uh, to express. 
Uh, Kim, uh, being a, uh, a psychotherapist as you are up in Chicago and doing our support group, uh, you're sharing with me this morning some some nice shifts that were happening in the support group last night. I'd maybe share a little bit of that with the group. And also, uh, if you were listening to the earlier part of the show, uh, again, I don't know the dynamic of what this young lady's dealing with, but uh, from your perspective and the legal uh, aspect of things, do you have any input if you were listening to that dialogue? Yeah, I was listening, and I wouldn't change anything you said, Michael. I've, uh, after uh, 35 and a half years of doing therapy, and I also have some experience, I began as a probation officer. So we frequently have to advise people um, about taking care of themselves and reporting things legally so that they don't end up either getting charged with negligence or getting charged with compliance. Um, but it is everybody's choice whether they're going to act on it um, to report somebody with suspicious behavior to the police. I've had to deal with several parents who've had to turn their kids over to the police because they find stolen property in the child's room. And uh, right. it always works out for the best when they do the hard thing up front, but it's the right thing and it's the loving thing, rather than trying to protect their children from the natural consequences of their children's choices. So, and the same goes for partners and husbands and wives. Yeah, the interest rate the universe charges on those situations is extremely high. Uh, when you know the, when the when the two year old isn't held accountable for the behavior, uh, they grow into a, a more bullying or a more angry three year old. And when the three year old isn't the five and the ten, then you know it just moves up. Now it's fights at school, and it's trouble at school, it's trouble in the educational system, and it, 13 it's petty theft and at 15 it's uh it's more serious theft and the 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 interest rate the the cost of learning the lesson gets much higher as time goes on and the sooner that's the advice i always give to people the sooner they uh they pay the piper the less the interest rate's going to be and it sounds like this has the potential to be a very serious circumstance and and as you say and, and you can always feed back to this fellow oh, it's all in your head there's nothing there then if it's uh if you report it legally and there's nothing there then there'll be nothing come of it so it's no big deal and uh he's he can take responsibility for what it is that he's setting up if there's nothing there then there's nothing to be concerned about if there is then you're not the one who's responsible, liable, or as the co culture would call it, to blame. But it is advisable to do the responsible thing. Yes, and it's actually the loving thing to do. Yes. I'm, yes. Not, I'm not helping somebody by shielding them from the natural consequences of their actions. Um, no. way, way back when I was in college, I, I wrote this down because it, there was so much craziness going on in the college that and I had people asking me to support them because I was their friend when what they were doing was clearly wrong and so I, I, I wrote this in my diary and I've used it in a lot of places and, and it's a saying that says I don't want friends that will stand behind me when I'm wrong I want friends who will stand on the side of what is right and invite me to see the error of my ways yeah yeah, that's good. Gee, you're a pretty bright college kid, weren't you? <laughs> I, I, something happened in the intervening time, and it's just been getting better and better. So I just want to let right. you know that that story for future reference is on page 42 and 43 in that book, The General Art of awesome. Blessing. Cool. Thank you, sir. So anything to share from the support group? We talked a little bit about it um, this morning. Uh, well, we had anything a... a we had a nice group. We had 13 people last night, and um, we worked through a worksheet at the end. One of our volunteers had a worksheet, and it was uh, – this might be useful. In in many of the, the worksheets we do, we don't get a magical transformation on the issue. But if we make notes in the margin about what comes up, then we have – the seeds for future worksheets which will help unravel the issue and that's the kind of thing that happened last night a gentleman was working on a worksheet and when he got to the end the the original um, is, issue was leaving him with feelings of um, hopelessness and frustration and anger and when he got down to the bottom and did step two we, we did a longer version but we got down to the bottom 
and it asked how he's feeling now, and his feeling there was sadness, and his thought about himself was that he's not smart enough, which is a completely different set of issues than he started with. So he wasn't feeling great at the end of the worksheet, but now he had a whole different and probably more productive set of of feelings and thoughts to work on in future worksheets. Yeah, a lot of people, that's a great point to make, Tim. A lot of people will do the worksheet and they get down to step six and they go, well, well, gee, you know, I don't feel any better. It's like, well, the, the idea of the worksheet isn't to feel better. The idea of the worksheet is to collapse the dissociated mind so you can deal with what's in it. And when you collapse it, if there's some drama and trauma, if there's some pain in there, then you get to deal with it. But much better to deal with it face-to-face than when it's hiding behind the door. Because what happens is in the most, un, you know, the most untoward circumstances, all of a sudden that part of the mind pops in. The behaviors, the thoughts, the feelings debilitate us. You know, when hostility or fear is in the mind, it defiles perception. And so if you, if you hold something that could defile your perception in the dissociated mind, then at, at points where you want to really be able to count on your mind, it's not going to be there for you. As you're willing to come into relationship with those things, as painful as they may be, you know, there's the old adage that says, the coward dies a thousand deaths, the brave only once. Uh, and, and that applies here in that the person who refuses to deal with what they've dissociated from will find that issue coming back again and again and again and again. Whereas if they confront it on any given level, they'll confront it once and work through it and be done with it. Or they'll perhaps end up also confronting it on many levels. You know, you can only go to the depth of an issue at the same height as you are in vitality. So if you're at a, you know, if we had a vitality meter and 10 was 100%, if you're at a level 5 and you've got an issue that's a level 7, you can only deal with a level 5 of that issue. And as you continue to do your work, it's going to come up again at a level 6 when you get to a 6, and it's going to come up again when you get to a 7. But each time it will be easier and easier and easier because you're peeling off those dissociated energies. And, you know, when you go back to the master teacher of forgiveness, they say, well, how many of these worksheets do we have to do anyway? Is 7 enough? And the reply that came back in the Aramaic is no. 77 times 70, which really means an infinite number of times until you're complete with that issue. And uh, there's no apology for that. That's just, well, that's our work. That's that's what we're here to do, and that's what we're here to support people in, and that's why we're so delighted to be doing this radio show, because wherever we go on the globe, we can now reach back to every town we've been in, and through our uh, radio show, support you in your questions and your thoughts and able to process with you. And, of course, there's a phone number if you want to call in live, as Dr. Tim has, and we'll be glad to chat with you about what's happening in your world and see if we can be of support in terms of the, the principles of the work that we're teaching. Okay, one of the things that just came up in the chat room uh, is it's the same person. And she's saying, you know, um, one of the other participants said, you know, you're worthy of having a loving, honest, and completely transparent man in your life, but that has to come after you are loving, honest, and transparent with yourself. And she said, well, that's the thing, that when they're together and when she just sees him, that's how he comes across. And she wouldn't have known any different if she hadn't put a bug on his phone. Right. Now, and now she knows, you know. Uh, you, you, once you put your hand in the plow, plow, there's crazy glue on the handle. You can't take it off. And I would offer that if you don't deal with this, it's going to fester. Uh, and and it's, it's going to bring an untoward conclusion to this relationship, I would offer, if you don't do something to clean it up. And she of said course, that she had a Dr. Pim- previous... I'm oh, sorry. I was she just going to say that, as Dr. Kim says, as Dr. Tim says, you know, you, you've got to deal with it as you choose to deal with it and and um, make your choices. Right. And she definitely has something she needs to look down into because her partner before this one came across the same way, that he was, you know, open and honest and she saw who he was. And then after two and a half years, then she found out that he was gay. And uh, huh. so it's like two two partners portray one person and then turn out to be somebody totally different. 
And so there's some part of her, what does she need to look into there? Well, I, w- I would suggest that your worksheets then I'd start working on self-betrayal. What part of you have you betrayed? What part of you have you not been true to? What part of you have you not been honest with and forthright with? And that that resonance draws somebody to you to play out that same behavior. So that would be, uh, I would suspect you'd probably find that to be very productive if you were to do some worksheets in that arena. And again, the worksheet can be downloaded at www.why. Again, again.com. We're also in South Florida, and we're going to be here for another couple of weeks. Uh, starting March 6th, we're doing a six-day series of free workshops. We'll be in Pompano Beach at the Unity Church, just off Atlantic Boulevard. Uh, Sunday morning, we'll be doing the Sunday service at 11 o'clock, and then at 1 to 4.30, we'll do Why Is This Happening to Me Again? And Tuesday night on Creating Consciously. Wednesday, I believe, is Healing Through Relationships. Gene, do you have the flyer there? Um, and codependence, communication, did you hear what I think I said? And then the last in the series on Friday night is Introduction to Advanced Understanding of A Course in Miracles, where we'll synthesize 70 different lessons from The Course in Miracles and offer a, an overview, a picture. Uh, one one person fed back to us after seeing that a fellow who'd worked with The Course for about 20 years said that uh, he realized that all the years he'd been working with it and after he heard this lesson that The Course was like a, a 50 billion piece jigsaw puzzle and nobody had the box top and once he did this lesson, he had the box top. So, if you're in uh, in the no- freezing Northlands and you want an intermission, you might want to come down for that week and join us. We're going to do that six days free. And then on Saturday and Sunday following, that's, the, I believe, the 12th and the 13th, we'll be doing a, uh, a kind of a mini intensive, a two-day intensive. We'll start at 9 in the morning, go through till 9 at night on Saturday, and then 9 until sometime between 5 and 6 on Sunday. Uh, working with stress, mind shifters, and still point breathing and purpose. So there's some of the upcoming events, and uh, once we're complete there, we're actually heading up to St. Augustine, and we're looking for a venue in St. Augustine or maybe Jacksonville, if anybody could help us out with that. We'd love to do a series while we're up there. And uh, and then on the 25th of March, we're flying out, heading out to Las Vegas, and we'll be spending probably a couple of weeks there, and if things come together, We'll be seeing Dr. Tim in Chicago if that all falls in place. So we're we're just kind of moving along. If you have a venue in Chicago, we're working on uh, setting something up there to go visit with folks in Chicago. So, Jenny, any other calls? Uh, this, this the call-in number is six four six two hundred four one six four one six nine four one six nine. So, if you have a question about anything we're talking about, please. Call in. We'd be delighted to support you. We're glad to be able to do Mind Shifters Radio, where we're working with the Aramaic process of forgiveness. I'm Dr. Michael Rice, and the other lovely voice in the background with that uh, New Jersey lilt is Jeannie, my wife. <laughs> Actually, I like to kid her about being born in New Jersey because she was, but of course, everybody who hears her awesome voice says, that's not a New Jersey accent. Well, it's true. She learned to speak in Tennessee and and Virginia, so. <laughs> a whole <Sure>. nother language. <laughs> a whole nother, a whole nother language, yes. <laughs> okay, can Michael speak a little bit about resonating frequencies and the state of society at the moment in time? Well, boy, that's a big one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of the assignments that I give to people, you know, I offer the thought that there are forces in the world that would like to keep us in our hostility and fear. And people say, well, that sounds like a conspiracy. Well, actually, there's no absolutely zero question there is a conspiracy. However, a conspiracy doesn't mean a bunch of people got together and said, hey, let's do this to them. A conspiracy is a conspiracy of non-responsibility. When I don't want to be responsible for my life and I hang out with other people and I sit around and I chat about and I gossip about them and, you know, here I have all these so-called friends in the room and then one of them leaves, I bite them on the butt and I, I rip the skin off their flesh and tear them down and tear them apart. Um, excuse me, that's not friendship. That's not friends. That's just resonating garbage. And so people who play that game, yeah, that's a conspiracy. But further than that, Anybody who's in hostility or fear, 
automatically functions as part of what I would refer to as that conspiracy. And I, I assign, I like in the classes to, to, to assign a really simple exercise to do, and that is take a piece of paper, sit in front of the television set with your remote control, spend no more than three minutes on one channel, take the page and draw a margin, a quarter of an inch down one side of the page, and in that quarter inch, every time as you're flipping through the channels, no more than three minutes on any station, every time you hear a word that's truly reflective of human life, of the actual awesome presence of love, put a check mark on that page. And every time you hear a, a word that reflects some form of hostility or fear, put a check mark on the page. You're only going to need a quarter inch margin, and you probably won't fill it by the time you fill the rest of the page with check marks about hostility or fear. And that's because that's the vibration, that's the frequency that run, tends to run our culture. And what runs the mind, you know, we've used the example the last few days, I say don't think about the color of your car, and, you know, the truth is I didn't say anything, I just set up a frequency with my voice, and, and just like as automatic as a tuning fork. If I had a middle seat tuning fork on a desk and I put it in front of a second middle seat tuning fork, without being touched, the second tuning fork starts to vibrate. Automatically, it's called resonance. It's an energy exchange. And so if I uh, am in a culture that is continuously resonating hostility, fear, you know, every movie, every television show, every song, I mean, you listen to the horrendous verbiage and frequency in so many songs, uh, songs advising men to beat up on women and women to sell themselves for garbage. You know, it, I mean, it's just crazy when... There's actually a, a, a passage, and if I remember correctly, it's in the book of Thomas. It, it didn't become one of the canonized books of the Bible, but in the book of Thomas, Yeshua laments and says, how has this awesome creature called the human fallen to this? What happened? And that's 2,000 years ago. You know, what happened that we are, every one of us starts out as love. You know, when Jeannie and I were in a, prison with nine-year-olds. We had about 100 kids, nine to 16 out in Phoenix. When you started, when we started to point out, and, and these kids had had an experience of younger brothers and sisters, we asked the question, how many have ever held a newborn? And the answers that excitedly come from them are these awesome descriptions of love. And then once Jeannie had put that list on the board, a long list of their descriptions, you know, these kids who are these tough guys, these hoods, these gals that are just, they're in prison at nine years of age out there. But when we turn and we point to that list and say, do you realize that that's a list of who you are? Their mouths gape open and they look with incredulity like, what? That's who I am? Yeah, that's how you started out. You know, somebody took you from the womb and went, what an awesome presence of love. How has love fallen to the estate that we're in in our cultures today? And I'd offer there's a single reason. And the single reason is we don't have forgiveness. And because we don't have forgiveness, these frequencies, these energies of hostility and fear that are presented in our culture imprint upon us, they're in our genetics, and because we don't know how to remove them, and forgiveness is the act of removing hostility or fear. You know, somebody who lives in a situation of horrendous rage and fear and pain and trauma and, you know, abuse, can't imagine a world without those frequencies. But you know something? The natural state of the human world contains none of that. And, and as you recognize that, you get to start shifting and you get to start changing. And you systematically work through that hostility and fear until you come back to a total experience of a human life. That is, a total experience of the active presence of love 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in doing so, you reclaim your birthright. Your birthright is to live as love. Your birthright is to experience your parents, your children, your creator as love. Now, there are many people who will give us many other messages. Their messages are not true. They are projections from a hostility and fear-based mind. The creator, love, couldn't create such a thing. We have made it up. 
and we can put an end to it if we've got the tools. And so our tools, and, you know, when somebody says, well, how do I do that? I offer all of the above, every tool we teach. There are about 15 different intensive, or pardon me, uh, 15 different workshops that we do. Uh, we have them on DVD. You can go to the website and download them. And in downloading those, uh, those, or pardon me, you can order them. And in listening to them, what you'll find is each one gives a different tool for how to reclaim your human essence, how to reclaim your human life until you just naturally live as the presence of love because that's what you're designed to do. That's what we humans are made of. And so that's our, our vote for you. That's our work together. Uh, you know, it's interesting in the, the churches, the, uh, the word that originally uh, represented people coming together in a church is called liturgy. And oftentimes that word is used unconsciously and people don't even know what it means, the liturgy. But liturgy means our common work. And I would offer that if humanity is going to survive in this world with the insanity that we have fallen into, that what we need to do is engage in a liturgy, engage in the common work of returning to a human life, of healing ourselves, of healing each other, and of healing our world, because we're designed for something better than this. So any questions in the chat room, Jeannie, or any calls? Um, actually, there was Everybody? one, and it, it had uh, it briefly had its hand up, and it disappeared. So 901, I'm not sure if you still had a question or not. 901, you're on the air. Did you have a question? Hello, 901, are you with us? Uh, who, who are we speaking to, and where are you calling from? I guess 901 isn't there anymore. Okay. Wasn't 901 the question, honey, the uh, the other day at the end of the show? Wasn't that a 901 call? It may have it may have been. So um, that question again was he, he had a partner, and they wanted to start. They were feeling guilty about not running around with their friends anymore, and the friends were kind of putting them on a a guilt trip, like they had lost them or, or whatever. And so it's kind of a pull between do I stay with my partner, do I go with my friends, or is there a happy medium here? And then, the, of course, the partner was wondering if they were out of place by expecting them to not go out with their friends. Yeah, you know, uh, again, as, as Dr. Tim said earlier, that's going to pretty much be something that uh, comes down to individual choice. You know, we all have to find a balance in our relationships and uh um, many people they want uh, uh, want a relationship with wall, uh, walls, and many people enjoy the security of a connected relationship. And uh, I think that um, as friends of those who enter into a relationship, especially the early stages of relationship, uh, you know, it's it's reasonable for people to be intensely connected and intensely close and enjoying the. Uh, energy that they exchange with each other, the space that they spend with each other. And I think as a friend, it's reasonable to uh, to understand that and to support uh, our relationships in, in being able to have that kind of intimacy and that kind of space that um, that is the beginning point of deep, uh, deep relationship. And so I really don't have much of a... Uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't advise because it's as u- unique as we are as individuals. However, if somebody's got issues around it, gee, I'm really angry because my friend seems to have disappeared from my relationship, well, great, now you've got some anger work to do. That's the worksheet process uh, that we've been talking about. You pick the worksheet process up and begin to work with it and work through your anger. If you've got loneliness issues, uh, abandonment issues, you know, all of those things will tend to play out in our relationship the closer and the tighter the relationship, the more and the deeper those things are going to tend to play out. And as we wake up to and take responsibility, then we start to shift and change things and we get more conscious. And conscious relationships don't require or manipulate anybody into anything. We offer support and liberty to each individual as we carry forward in those friendships and those close relationships. 
Well, we're down to about 20 seconds left, Michael. Um, so everybody, thank you for coming to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice. Our website's www.whyagain.com. And thanks for joining us. And we just hold the space that uh, using these tools that you will have the best year yet of your eternal life. And I hope your day is blessed. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. <laughs>